Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School today. It's a delightful thing to study the book of Romans and especially our purpose is to see Romans as the 1888 messengers brought out the truths that were in that book written by Paul. But before we begin, we want to offer prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we may study together and gain new insights from the precious good news that Jesus has died for us. And we pray that you'll bless us to that end. In, in Jesus' name, amen. This is lesson number eight entitled, The Man of Romans 7. So we ask the question, is the man of Romans 7, verses 7 through 25, a godless man? Is he the unconverted man? Or is this chapter 7 describing the experience of the normal born-again Christian? Some even say that Paul is here describing his own frustrating experience as a believer in Christ. Certainly Romans 7 portrays a man in difficulty, a man who is in distress, a man who seems doomed to defeat and failure in his spiritual life. He appears caught up in a conflict between his own sinful tendencies and desires on the one hand and the just requirements of God's holy law on the other hand. We see here an account of temptations resisted but not overcome, of goals that have not been reached and of purposes that remain unfulfilled, of ideals held but not attained, of a victory that is greatly longed for but not gained, of a conflict that is terrible and that regularly ends in defeat. We see pictured here the experience of one that might be described as a born loser, a frustrated, defeated person. What a predicament this is. Who is this man who apparently for years is unable to achieve and who lives in frustration and defeat? There are two main views that have been held through the centuries uh, by Christians regarding the man of Romans 7. The first view is that the man of Romans 7 is describing an unregenerate, an unconverted, a carnal man whose heart is naturally in rebellion against God and his law. And the other view is that the man of Romans 7 is Paul himself in his regenerate, converted experience after he has come to know Christ. If this is true, then it's evidence that victory over temptation and sin is not available to Christians in this life. If Paul could not stop sinning, even through the power of Christ, it proves that no one can stop sinning. The problem that we encounter with both of these lines of thought is that neither one stands up well under investigation. Do unregenerate sinners confess that God's law is holy and just and good, as we read in verse 12? Do they acknowledge that God's law is spiritual, but that I am carnal, verse 8, 14? Do unregenerate, unconverted men say in verse 19, The good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Do unregenerate men, unconverted men say, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, as we read in verse 22? Because most unregenerate people hate the law of God and love sin. They will not to do good, but to do evil. They certainly do not delight in the law of God after the inward man. Then on the other hand, if the born-again Paul is writing about himself, why would he say in verse 14, I am carnal? And then a few lines later write in Romans 8, 7 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. Why would Paul say, I am sold under sin in verse 14? And contradicting what he just wrote about being then made free from sin in Romans 6, verse 18. Why would Paul say that he found it impossible to stop doing the evil he hated in verses 15 through 23. And in the same discussion, write in Romans 8, verse 4, 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Why would Paul describe himself as being in captivity to the law of sin? In verse 23, and in the same discussion write, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. In Romans 6 verse 22. The idea that Paul just uh, couldn't stop sinning, that he couldn't quite quit swearing and lying and committing adultery, that doesn't harmonize with the rest of his writings. You could compare that with 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, or 2 Corinthians 5.17, or Galatians 2.20 among many texts, and especially Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Are there any other alternatives that might help us to understand what Paul is writing about in the man of Romans 7? And yes, there is. And it's a little idea that is derived from the 1888 message regarding the two covenants. Paul is describing the frustrations and defeats that inevitably follow those who are living under the old covenant. Paul sums up the reason for defeat in Romans 7 verse 25. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, the words I myself in the original are ego autos, where and that would never be used to describe a joint effort or action or a cooperative relationship between two persons, that is, Christ and the believer. It means, I myself means emphatically, I alone. In Romans 7.25, it means, I without Christ. And it vividly describes a man under the old covenant, trying in his own strength to obey God's law and become righteous. And this was ancient Israel's problem with their old covenant promises. Pretty much described in Romans 9 verse 32, I read from Moffat's translation, where it reads, And why? Simply because Israel relied not on faith, but on what they could do. That's the old covenant. The man of Romans 7 is neither the converted or the unconverted Paul, per se. But it's describing the corporate eye of the fallen, sinful human race apart from Christ. This is describing the predicament of fallen humanity. Romans 7.18, In me nothing good dwells. Now, if nothing good is there, as I am part of the corporate body of Adam, all evil could dwell there. Nobody else is inside of them any worse than I am. One of the leading brethren who opposed Elliot Wagner's views of the two covenants in our 1888 history, and by the way, Ellen White endorsed E.J. Wagner's views on numerous occasions, regarding the two covenants, including a statement in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 370 to 373. Well, one of those who opposed uh, Wagner's ideas on the two covenants wrote this in the Review and Herald, uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled by us instead of fulfilled in us, in Romans 8, verse 4. You know, the great mass of Seventh-day Adventist church members who, worldwide who have come out of the world are converted in the sense that they have been baptized and they go to church Sabbath after Sabbath, but who know no victory over sin. They're burdened by sinful Old Covenant fear, which motivates their trust in God. The problem that God has to deal with is indwelling sin in his people today. Not Adam's condition in the Garden of Eden, 
the remnant church as a consequence is lukewarm as described by Jesus in, a, in his Laodicean message. The vast majority of Seventh-day Adventists worship every Sabbath, seventh day of the week, but Laodicea is forced to confess, that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I, and then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. You know, Laodicea has long consented that the law is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Romans 7 verses 15 through 18. The sinless Adam, before he fell, had no such problem. Merely for Christ to redeem Adam's failure and stop with such a victory would mean that the church is doomed to perpetual lukewarmness and the problem of sin that dwells within and compels us to sin can never be solved. Hence the incarnate Christ must condemn sin in the flesh, abolish in his flesh the enmity as we read about in Romans 8.3 and Ephesians 2.15 which the sinless Adam never had to do. While the Old Covenant was the promise of people to obey God in their own strength, the New Covenant is God's promises to us. God's covenant and His promises are one and the same. We need not make promises to God, but only to accept His promise to us. We accept these promises of God by faith, and this faith being a heart response to Christ's love, which is revealed to us in the fullest manner on Calvary, this is a saving transaction. And this faith that saves is a faith which worketh and is motivated by love, Galatians 5, 6. So this faith which reconciles us to God also reconciles us to his law and so makes us obedient to his law and his will. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news that is shown to us in God's everlasting covenant. And we pray that we will believe his promises, accept what he desires to accomplish in us, a faith which works by divine love. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen.